All right, church family, join me today in Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. If you have a hard time finding Genesis chapter 22, you'll know it's between chapter 21 and 23. Amen. So find Genesis chapter 22. Hey, there was a notorious strict professor at a university that held tenaciously to one of his policies. Anytime that he gave an exam, he required that every student be in the seat when the time for class started. So if no one, if someone was not in their seat, they automatically got a zero on their exam. Well, the end of the year exam came up and all the students were in their seat as they were supposed to be, except for one. All the students got started on their exam and about halfway through, that one late arriver showed up and walked to his seat. The professor said, you know the rules, that if you're not here on time, that you get a zero, you might as well leave. Well, the young man didn't say anything. He just sat down and picked up his exam and began to take his work. The professor said again, you know the rules. Why do you waste your time? You've already got a zero on this exam. You've already failed. Don't even waste your energy. Well, the young man just continued to work as if he didn't even hear the professor. And so the professor did not want to disrupt all the other students, so he thought he'd just let the young man continue. While the rest of the class were finishing up, they'd bring their test up, they'd drop it on the professor's desk, and they would walk out quietly. Well, this young man, the late arriver, just continued to finish his exam. The professor was curious and thought he would just let him go ahead and finish. Well, about 20 minutes later, the young man comes up with his exam, and the, the professor once again says, you know you've already earned a zero because you were late to class. The young man said, don't you know who I am? The professor said, no, I really don't. The young man smiled and slipped his exam in the middle of the stack. <laughs> All right. So understand today we're going to talk about a test or an exam that Abraham faces. Abraham has been in the academy of God learning lessons of faith. Many tests and many exams before this. Many quizzes. Sometimes he got a passing grade and sometimes he did not. But today we come to that big final exam. This is the big test. Here's the one where he is going to come in and really demonstrate his faith. He's either going to obey God or he's going to fail to obey God. And we learned last week about uh, Abraham sacrificing Ishmael. Remember, Ishmael was the son that was illegitimate, the son that of the flesh, the son that God never planned for that, though we know that the child was not a mistake, but the way the child came about was, amen. And God saw to protect that child and the mother, but they were to be sent out. We talked about how God sometimes wants us to send out, not our children, amen, but the works of the flesh that are in our life, the things that hold us back from God's perfect plan. We are to remove those from our life. And Abraham had to, by faith, obey God. But today we're going to learn about his favorite child. The child of promise. The child that he and Sarah had waited so long to receive. The one that they had longed for and prepared for. He was now born. And yet God says, give your child to me. <coughs> Friends, I want you to know that God is the Lord of all parts of our life. Even the things that mean the most to us. Even the things that are the most cherished to us. They belong ultimately to God and we have to live our lives with open hands. But the things that we try to hold on to, even including our family, can become idols in our life. That we must put God first in all things, including our spouses, including our children, including our career, including our health, including our finances. Everything we have is God's and deserves to be laid at His feet. Abraham has the big exam. 
Let's look together whether he passes it or not. Now, I do want to give you a disclaimer. Understand that our God, the God of the Bible, Yahweh, is a God that does not ask for child sacrifice. Amen. Amen. Now, if you have teenagers, as I do, you understand why this may be appealing to us. But it's never commanded by God. This right here is a, well, is a story without precedent and without parallel in Scripture. It's not precedent because God had never demanded human sacrifice before this. This was common amongst the pagans of the land. This was common where the nation of Israel lived. This was common amongst the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites. Many of them would sacrifice their own children. There's even a historical account that those who worshipped a god named Molech would build a large statue that was hollowed out and they would place a burning fire at the base of it that would heat the statue so hot, so warm that it would be glowing with heat and they would lay their precious children in the arms of that statue. Friends, we know that the devil, the Bible says, is a murderer from the beginning. He's a, a liar. He wants to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And there's no one that is more vulnerable than our children. Amen, Brother Dale? We live in a time where Satan does not change his tactics. He wants to continue to kill children. And we even have laws today that allows that to happen. The devil is continuing his same sinister strategy. But God is not that way. God values our children. He values our life physically and spiritually. So this is without presence, without parallel, never again. And throughout all of Scripture does God ever command human sacrifice. He does command animal sacrifice, which was a bloody, grotesque, very visceral thing. And it was designed to be that way by God to show the heinousness of our sin. It's to show us that something has to die because sin always leads to death. And either that sin is on us and it leads us to death physically and spiritually or something outside of us takes that death for us. And we know that all those deaths of those poor animals in the Old Testament all foreshadow that one death of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Deuteronomy 12.31 says this, You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, for every abomination to the Lord which He hates, they have done to their gods, lowercase g, for they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Again, I want you to hear this because this causes some question in some people's minds. They use this chapter to criticize God, that they say that God is an evil God or a vindictive God. How dare God do this to Abraham? How could God expect Abraham to sacrifice his only boy? Well, number one, we'll see that God stops him from sacrificing his boy, that he gives a substitute for that. But God is also not asking Abraham to do anything that God is not willing to do Himself. Right. You'll be reminded today through this, and as you read this account, remember that God the Father was willing to sacrifice His darling Son, Jesus Christ, the perfect One, on Mount Calvary, suspended between heaven and earth. That's the kind of God we have. A kind of God that does not do what's harmful for us, but does for us what we desperately, desperately need. Here we go. Three points. In your sermon outline, inside your worship bulletin, it says this. Number one, we want to see Abraham's sorrow. Abraham's sorrow. Beginning in verse 1, chapter 2, chapter 22. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. 
And he said, Here I am. After these things, that means we need to think about what happened before. That was this whole story that we've been studying over the past five or six weeks. This story of Abraham receiving the promise of God, sometimes obeying, sometimes disobeying, sometimes getting ahead of God. But now we see that God has answered that, given him his son, the promised son named Isaac. After those things, we come to this testing. Understand that testing always comes in our life. Sometimes after the highest points, testing arrives. We see that in the life of Jesus Christ Himself, when He burst onto the scene with His earthly ministry, when He is baptized by John the Baptist, and whenever God speaks from heaven and says, This is my beloved Son, listen to Him, guess what the very next thing happens? He is placed into the wilderness to face those temptations for 40 days. Understand that after your spiritual high marks, Many times there's a testing and a trial that comes. That there's mountaintops and there are valleys. And that's all part of the rhythm of life. But I want to challenge you as we are looking at this to understand that you can use testings in one of two ways. You can either allow the devil to use those tests that you are facing to destroy you. Or allow God to use those very same tests to develop you. God wants to use the test that you are facing right now. The things that are placed before you because of the circumstances that you are in. They may not be even things that you have control of. It may be even things that God's allowing to happen in your life at this time as He did for Job. That He's wanting to use those things to develop you, not destroy you. We've got to get outside of the mindset of the, oh, it's me. Why has this happened to me? Why, God? Why now? And we need to turn that to what now, God? God, now that this is happening to me, this is going on, this is the doctor's report, this is the situation at work, this is what's happening, God. What do you want to do with it to develop me? I bet if you would ask Brother Dale about what they've went through as an organization over the past year, he would have chosen not to have had to gone through that. But as he has went through it, I'm sure you've learned a lot about yourself and about your organization. I bet you've seen people rise up in faith. You've been able to see the churches and ministers and Christians all across our commonwealth stand up and say, let's do the right thing. Let's stand for God's principles. You've seen God's hand. It's probably developed you and you're probably stronger now than you were before. So we probably see that with Abraham. I'm sure he would not have written this account into his life story. If he was writing his own autobiography, he would have left this out. He would not have wanted this experience. But God put him through it to purify him, to develop him, to strengthen him. And I love what Abraham says. Here I am. Abraham had trained himself to hear the voice of God. That when God would speak to Abraham, he was on ready to hear the Lord. Now you know, my friends, that God no longer needs to speak in a voice because He speaks now in a verse. Amen? That you have the Word of God available to you that you can open it up at any time, whether an actual Bible or on your phone or an audio Bible. You can hear the voice of God and you should be setting on ready to say, Here I am, Lord. A teachable spirit, a desire to have God's Word penetrate your heart and your mind, to direct your steps, to guard your heart. You hear the voice of God every time you open the book of God. Amen. Amen. Here he says, here I am. Now friends, remember, we need the voice of God in our life. That is the essence of the Christian faith. Hearing and heeding God. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Friends, we want to make sure that God's Word is heard in our hearts, our minds, and our soul. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. 
Church, you need to be systematically and intentionally getting yourself under the Word of God and in the Word of God. You come to the mission church on Sunday and hear the message preached, and I do my dead level best to try to bring a message from God's Word. But if this is the only time that you consume a meal and feast upon God's Word, you are going to die of spiritual malnutrition. Amen. Now you can even come back on Wednesday to our midweek refuel Bible study and that's a little bit better, but you can't just be fed by somebody else. You need to be a self-feeder yourself. That you need to be able to hear the Word of God, read the Word of God, be in the Word of God, memorize the Word of God, meditate on the Word of God, and most importantly, live the Word of God. Abraham says, here I am. He is ready to respond. He has ears that are open to when God speaks. Church family, are you here today with your ears open? Have you come today to church saying, God, here I am. Speak to me. I can promise you today that God will speak to you from God's Word, from the Holy Spirit, through the voice of other brothers and sisters in Christ, God has a word for you today. There's something God wants to teach you. Something God wants to reveal to you. There's something God wants you to do. There might be something God wants you to stop doing. There's something today that God wants to change in your heart, your life, your mind. But are you listening? Abraham was listening. Now friends, we're going to see here that he faces this test it is a test about his first love. Bible says in Matthew 10, 37, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Understand that Jesus was not a seeker since the preacher. Amen. <laughs> he spoke some hard truths. He set this standard so high that our love for God must supersede every other relationship in our life. I love my dear wife and my children. I love them with all my heart. But understand, I love Jesus more. Amen. Amen. They know that if I love Jesus more, I'm going to love them better. I don't love them perfectly, but I, I want to love them better. I want to love them perfectly. But it all begins with my commitment to God and love for God. You get that right. All the other relationships come together. Amen? So here was a test. God said, I finally gave you what you've been asking for, what I promised to you. Here's the promised child. Now the question is, do you love the gift? Or do you love the giver? Do you love the blessing? Or do you love the blesser? Many people use God this way. Many people sitting across churches all across our city, all across our state, all across our country are loving God for what they can get out of God. They're loving God because God's blessing them and providing for them. They're loving God because it makes them feel good. They're loving God because it's salvaging their marriage. They're loving God because it's giving them an advantage in their workplace. They're loving God for some reason. Friends, if you're loving God for something He's doing for you, as soon as that thing that's, that you think you need and you want and you love so much begins to fall apart, your love for God will begin to fall apart. Friends, we love God simply because He's God. Amen? Amen? We love God because Jesus died for us. We love God not because of anything that, that we've received from Him, but for simply who He is. That can even be stretched out to a, to a seemingly uh, spiritual thing about heaven. God, I thank God for a real place called heaven. Amen? Heaven is real as hell. is real literal places that eternity will be spent. But friends, I would be a Christian even if there was no heaven. Amen? Amen. Because Jesus sacrificed His life for me. It's worth giving myself fully to Him because of what He's done for me. Not out of greed. Not out of guilt but out of gratitude. Amen? 
we see Abram facing this test. That test can be a good thing if they develop us. Don't let them destroy us. Verse 2 goes on to say this. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now understand, by this time, scholars tell us that Isaac may have been anywhere from teenager all up to maybe 30 years old. Scholars are not absolutely sure, but there's been some time. And we no doubt saw that even Abraham's relationship with Isaac became very sweet. Abraham loved his boys. He invested in his boys. He spent time with his boys. And no doubt by now, he and Isaac had made many good memories. They probably spent much time working side by side. They spent much time talking about Yahweh, the true and living God. They spent much time, Isaac, seeing the way his father interacted with his mother and fathers. Hear this. You are a model for your boys. That your boys need to see you living a godly life. Some research says that most children only get... 15 minutes of quality time with their father per week. Shame on us. Amen? Men of God, there is nothing more important for you to do than to invest in your children. Sons and daughters, make sure that you are making priority time for them. Don't forsake them on the altar of your career. Don't forsake them for lesser things. Make sure that you're investing in your boys. I believe that Abraham was a good father. I believe that he invested much time into this boy. No doubt people probably said, hey, your son there, he's rotten. And Abraham probably said, well, all kids smell that way. <laughs> we see here that there's a command from God to take this son he loved to a land called Moriah. That's important. Mount Moriah is an important place. We see later in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles 3.1, Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount, everybody say Moriah, Moriah. where the Lord had appeared to his father David at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Hey, this was holy ground. This was sacred ground. We see all the way in Genesis chapter 22 that God chose that piece of real estate, that mountain called Moriah, and said, I want you to take your boy there to sacrifice him as a foreshadow of what I will do on that same mountain chain about 2,000 years after this. And about 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ was sacrificed on that same mountain chain we notice Mount Calvary. On that same mountain chain, Mount Moriah, that's where in the Old Testament they built the temple of God. If you go there today, you can stand on the Mount of Olives, you can look down, and now you no longer see the temple of the true and living God. You see the Dome of the Rock. On that very same location that took place here in 22 where God says take your special son, the one you love so much, the one that's so valuable to you, let's test your faith so we can grow your faith. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Abraham rose early in the morning. Why did he rise early? I think because he did not want to tell Sarah. <laughs> he got up early while Sarah was still asleep because he didn't know how to verbally process this thing. He didn't know how he was going to tell his dear wife this was happening. But we also see the positive side of this, that Abraham obeyed without delay. Amen? He did not even wait for the morning coffee. 
He probably had a sleepless, restless night. God spoke this to him. He knew, I've got to be obedient to do this. I've been disobedient times before, and I saw the mess that it's made. I even know this is hard for me to comprehend. I cannot wrap my mind around this, God. But you said it, and I'll do it. And you know that sometimes God doesn't owe us an explanation. We'll see in this chapter that God never even explains why he asks him to do this. Abraham doesn't ask for an explanation. He simply obeys. Christian, don't demand explanations from God. We don't live from his explanations. We live by his commands and by his promises. Amen. What God says to do, we do it. We know that God is the author of all good things. That God's working all things together for his good. That we believe that God is looking out for our best interest. If we put him first, as Jesus said, seek the kingdom of God first. And all these other things will be provided to us. Amen. Seek God first. That's what Abraham was being taught to do with his boy. Seek God first. Now we understand he had this complete obedience without delay, without debate, without deviation. And friends, that should be the description of every child of God. John 14, 15 says this. If you love me, keep my commandments. Understand that your beliefs will result in behaviors. The things that God says to do as a disciple of Christ, you're setting on ready to obey them. Jesus even once said to folks, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but do not do the things I say? Friends, are you like Abraham? When he brings something to your attention, when he's asking you to do something, do you obey obediently, instantaneously, and fully? Verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. A three day journey. Can you imagine those three days? Can you imagine those nights? Can you imagine those conversations that Abraham had? The Bible does not record those conversations, but we can assume that he was a man of clay, just like you and me. He no doubt struggled and wondered, but we see also he did not take a detour. He did not stop. He did not get distracted. Three days was roughly the amount of time it would take to walk or to travel by a beast of burden. The 50 miles that it would take to get from Beersheba to Jerusalem. From where God spoke to him to Mount Moriah would take about a three day journey. I think this is here intentionally to say that Abraham didn't stop along the way. He didn't say, God, maybe I didn't hear you. Let me take a long cut around. He came and he did, even though he may have had some questions, no doubt, some struggles. He may have had some faith wrestling matches, but he took a straight path to obedience to God. And Abraham said to his young man, to his young men, stay here with the donkey, the lad, and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. In your Bible, I would underline, circle, highlight, use a crayon, use your lipstick, whatever you got to do, and underline that we. Abraham did not fully understand what God was asking him to do, he just knew that God would be faithful to his promises. Remember, God had said, your son Isaac will be the father of many people. That Isaac is your promised son, and through him there would be so many descendants to be like the stars of the heaven and the sand of the sea. You'll be a blessing to all of mankind. Through Isaac, one day the Savior would come. Abraham knew that promise, but he also had the direction to take this same boy and to sacrifice him as a burnt offering. He didn't know exactly how God was going to do it, 
But he believes somehow, someway, and I think in his primitive understanding of the concept of the resurrection that he understood somehow if God said kill your boy that God would rise him back to life. Friends, I want you to know this, that Abraham did not have the benefit that we have today. We have the story of Lazarus in the Bible. We have the story of Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday morning. We have the story of the resurrections through the book of Acts showing and showing the power of God and the authentication of the message. Abraham had none of that. But he had a promise of God. Amen. God had told him, your boy Isaac would be your blessed son. That through him you will have many descendants. And Abraham knew that God was always true to his promises. He said, we're going to go and worship, guys. Don't know exactly how it's going to happen, but we will be back. That was the first Terminator, amen? We will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. Boy, does that not cause you to think ahead to Jesus Christ? As he carried that cross beam of the cross, the wood he carried down the Rio de la Rosa as he walked to the cross, he carried that and stumbled and fell and spoke and had compassion on others. This is picturing exactly what Jesus will do about 2,000 years from this time frame. He took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? That tells me that Isaac was used to worshiping with his daddy. That they were used to having sacrifices together. That this wasn't a new experience. This wasn't the boy's first time going to church. Amen? This was something that was part of their family routine that Abraham and his boy would go often and build a burnt sacrifice. They knew what it was like to lift the name of God high. This wasn't new, but there was a twist this time. The boy realized we got the fire, we got the wood, we got the altar. Where is the sacrifice? It was going to say here, and Abraham said, my son, this is good, verse 8 is good. God will provide for Himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide for us. There's going to be a substitute. There's going to be a sacrifice. I don't know exactly how this is going to work out, but God is going to do something. I love it says that they went together. Remember, Isaac was a teenager to a grown man at this time. So not only was there faith on the part of Abraham, there was a faith on the part of Isaac. Isaac could have manhandled his father at this time. Isaac could have beat his dad up. Isaac could have ran away. Isaac could have prevented this from happening. But Isaac too was being obedient to God. And they came to the place of which God too fast here. Yes. All right. Well, we better be here to the next point then. Okay. Uh, Dale took all my time. Just kidding, Dale. <laughs> Number two, Isaac's submission. Isaac's submission. Verse 9 says this. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac. And Isaac had to allow this to happen. His son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And we see here in verse 11 something very, very important. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And so he said, here I am. Again, there is that God saying twice, Abraham, Abraham. God sometimes has to repeat to us so we can listen. Abraham, Abraham, we see God do this. Other places, He said, Moses, Moses, from the burning bush. And He said, here I am. 
God says, Samuel, Samuel, in the middle of the night. And Samuel said, here I am. God said, Saul, Saul, on the road to Damascus. And Saul said, here I am. Well, today God is saying to you, Josh, Josh, Cheryl, Cheryl, Ron, Ron, Dale, Dale. Are you going to say, here I am? In the midst of your trial, in the midst of your challenge, in the midst of your circumstances, here I am, God. I'm on my spiritual tippy toes with excitement, ready to see how you're going to step in. God, how are you going to intervene in this situation? God, how are you going to show up? He's calling your name. Be ready to say, here I am, Lord. I don't know all the details, but I'm saying yes, nonetheless. We see the submission of Isaac quickly. Verse uh, number three, God's substitute. Here's where it really gets good. Really gets good here. It says this. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Abraham passed the test. Amen. Abraham was willing. He drew back the knife. He was ready to follow through in obedience. And God stopped him and provided a substitute. Then Abraham lifted his eyes, looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham took, went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Friends, I want you to hear this, just to sum things up. We saw here on Mount Moriah, what man will do for their love of God. Abraham loved God first of all and most of all. He loved God even more than his most precious, prized, earthly possession. He was willing to lay it down and sacrifice to the Lord. We see the love of man for God on display at Mount Moriah, but on Mount Calvary, we see what God's love for man will do. We see on Mount Calvary how God the Father sacrificed His darling Son, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And church, I'm here to tell you, on that day 2,000 years ago, on that mountain, whenever Jesus was about to die on the cross, there was nobody to shout out, Stop. There was no substitute. There was no other. There could be no other substitute. Only Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, fit the bill to be the sacrifice for you and for me. And He was willing to do that. So church friends, family, those who are watching online today, we must put our faith where God has put our sins. That's on Jesus Christ. If you are trusting anything else today for your salvation, you are missing the point. If you're trusting your good works, if you're trusting your good life, if you're trusting your love for your family, if you're trusting your bank account, if you're trusting your reputation, if you're trusting anything other than Jesus' sacrifice for you, you are missing the point of Scripture. Maybe today is your day. Maybe today is the day that God's made this truth real to you. 
that you've heard the gospel today that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. That if you go into eternity in that sinful condition, that you have a Christless eternity awaiting you. But God has made a way through His darling Son, Jesus Christ, for you to have your sins forgiven, to be made right in the sight of a holy God, to have a, a fresh start, a new beginning, a clean slate, that you can have your sins subtracted and God's righteousness added. That's your need today. As soon as we begin to sing our time of response, I'll be in the front ready to receive you. Maybe you aren't going to come forward today, but you want to know more about what it means to be a Christian accepting Christ on your connection card. Simply mark that box. Myself, one of our leadership team will reach out to you and help you to understand what it means to be a Christian. For those watching at home today, if we can serve you in any way, if you have any questions at all, please communicate that to us. Send us a message so we know how best to serve you and your family. Father, we thank